South than Leonardo. Um, he was voted last year by the lay public of, as the number one genius. And we are especially lucky because we have Dr. Robert Simon with us. He received his doctorate in art history from Columbia, and he's lectured extensively and authored numerous publications in the fields of old master paintings, as well as con cons cons I'm sorry, valuation and collecting. He's been a research fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's been a consultant to museums, to art dealers, institutions, and private collectors. Um, what's really exciting to me about having uh, Dr. Simon, uh, uh, besides his knowledge of Leonardo, is that he is one of the discoverers of a painting of Leonardo's that he authenticated in the early 2000s that had been basically lost and um, unknown to us. And we're gonna, we're gonna see that uh, toward the end of our talk today. So um, he's, he's like a rare gem here. So we're, we're really, I'm really excited to have him. Um, so let's, as we usually do, begin at the beginning. Um, which is that uh, Leonardo was born in, in 1452 to uh, Father um, Ser Piero, who's a notary. Well, he wasn't a notary yet, but he was sort of uh, a more upper class, middle, let's say, upper class uh, man. Uh, and the mother was basically a peasant girl um, to whom he was not married, but he was quite the ladies' man. And um, the father didn't want... Ser Piero to marry this girl as a peasant girl. That wouldn't have been a good marriage for him. And this is um, actually the writing of, of the grandfather. Yes, this is, this is a, the, the beginning of what we know about Leonardo. And I think you can probably make out the words very clearly there, the translations below. It's, it's basically a diary entry, entry from Antonio da Vinci, essentially, his, his grandfather, the father of, of, of Piero in which he says, at this particular time, my son had a, had a son. Three hours past sunset, they had time, it was sort of, uh, the, the day began at, uh, at, that, at that point in, ter in terms of the chronology, and his name is Leonardo. And you can see, uh, if you look very carefully, the, the, the word, um, word spelled out. But the document also tells us a few other things. One is that the mother is not mentioned uh, there. Her name was Katerina. Um, and from this, we know that he was illegitimate. There are a list of, uh, of, of people that are at the bottom of the page that, who are witnesses at the baptism. Uh, from, and the, and for this, we know that he was kind of accepted in his, in, in his uh, uh, household. Uh, and, and, uh, but it's also, as much as this is a very precious document, it's one of the very few uh, detailed evidences that we have of uh, the personal life uh, at the very beginning, clearly, of, of, of Leonardo. So, uh, and, that, and that is important because, you know, obviously, so, uh, you know, we, I've done previous people here where we have a lot of information, and there is remarkably little clearly known information because it was so long ago and because not that much was written until later. Um, and so we're going to be doing some, obviously, speculating. But I think one thing that's important is he was illegitimate, and that mattered because, well, he was accepted by the father's family. That was important because, obviously, that was a way that he was going to eat and survive and perhaps move his way also into sort of an upper middle class life. But he was raised for the first number of years by his biological mother, by Katerina, and then removed and taken into his father's home. So he had sort of the loss of his mother, if you will, at the age of like four or five. And then he had this stepmother because, of course, the father did marry somebody of his station. Um, and the father actually married four times. Four times, yes. <laughs> as I said, as I said yeah. he was a ladies' man. He, yeah. he, he, um, he liked the women, yeah. and, uh, but he did marry four times. And he had many children. He went on to have, like what, I think, nine sons mm. and five daughters. Um, so he had his own legitimate children. He never... Um, legitimized Leonardo, um, and that matters because, for example, the church said if you were illegitimate, you could not have a formal education. They didn't really accept you formally into the educational system. Yeah, and we don't really know even the details. We a lot we assume that when he was brought up with his mother, without his mother, with his, with his adopted, I mean, his stepmother essentially. And, um, uh, but we, we certainly know that the very key uh, element in his artistic education is when he 
uh, is introduced to, uh, this, the image now is Vinci. Now, of course, that's, we're all very familiar from his name, but Vinci, just if you're not familiar, is just outside of Florence. It's a hill town. This is, it looks pretty much the same as it, as it, did, uh, uh, as it did in Leonardo's time. And, and so he's uh, coming from, uh, from this small little village into Florence, the main center, through the, um, through the efforts of his father, who is a friend of Andrea del Verrocchio, is one of the great artists of the time, patronized by the Medici family, and, and um, celebrated for, in different media. I mean, he works in sculpture. The, the, the image on the, on the left is of the monument of Colleone that's in Venice. And the picture on the right is of the, uh, an altarpiece of the baptism, which is in the Uffizi today. So uh, Leonardo is, um, at, at a, probably around 14, brought into Florence, uh, apprenticed to, uh, to this great master, where his, uh, his own abilities really take on an, an amazing new, uh, new And actually, direction. it was, in a way, very supportive of his father to, to have him do this, because being a notary had been in the family. It was the, the grandfather was an important notary. He felt that he wanted to be an important notary, um, Ser Pedro, that is, and he probably wanted his son also to be a notary, but recognized that he had this artistic ability this, and this artistic interest, um, and, and as you said, had, you know, had this connection and, and had him apprentice here. Um, but the, I just want to point out, because um, when you think about somebody who does so many, as he goes on to do, so many creatively genius things, and you want to ponder why, what, you know, what was it about him that made him um, so wildly creative in so many different arenas? When you think about creativity, much of it has to do with divergent thinking, you know, unusual thinking that's out of the box for the other people of your time some thinking that moves you ahead in some way because no one's thought of whatever that is before. And not going to formal schooling. Formal schooling at that time being a lot of indoctrination into certain rote ways of thinking, let's say. It's not to say that someone couldn't go to school and be a genius, but um, I, w I would just say I would wonder if the fact that he couldn't go to school and that he got a lot of his education, if you will, as a child out in nature. He had this uncle, Francesco, who was apparently, you know, a, um, you know, liked to, to, to sort of spend time with Leonardo and looking around, exploring things, looking at little animals and trees and just being out in nature. And that seemed to be a source of um, a great, of enjoyment um, and perhaps inspiration for him. But he, he was not educated formally. No, I mean, one of the, uh, the, the element, uh, clearly he was um, well read, as when uh, later on in life, we, his references to many, many classical authors, but he probably had a rudimentary knowledge of Latin, um, which was kind of the, is, was, is, was a, um, a separation point between the very literate and, and those that are, have a, 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 a different kind of knowledge. So that was a limitation. He was, uh, at one point, uh, called a, uh, a man without letters because he, um, because he didn't have that that particular qualification, as it were. And yet, clearly, he did know some Latin and had familiarity with with many many authors uh, of antiquity and of uh, of the contemporary time. So, not you know, uh, it, it's it's a standard of of how, uh, question of what ha what his. His, his knowledge would be in the standards of the time. But, um, and, and the other point is, is really that the church, in terms of education, uh, was thought that one should not be left-handed, that being left-handed was kind of almost like a sign of the devil, or you know, it, was, it was not okay mm -hmm. to be a lefty, basically. Mm -hmm. And they trained you out of that, often, if you attended school. Um, he did not, and he was left-handed. And no one tried to change that. And interestingly, he didn't try to change that, even though it would not have been looked on in, you know, in such a terrific light. He was OK, let's say. Or, well, we don't know if he was OK. But he didn't <laughs> try to change the fact that he was left-handed. Um, and he operated that way. And that also makes you think about somebody who, from a personality perspective, um, conformity might not be that important. Well, certainly the, the uh, independent spirit, if you will, is something that is throughout his, uh, his career as evidenced by all his ac the activities that he undertook and by the, 
variety of them and not sort of settling into one particular profession. Um, and so that, that um, you know, that's something that one sees in, in basically every aspect of his of his. Now, life. I don't know how apocryphal this is, but in the baptism of Christ, it, I, my understanding is that Leonardo was painting, you know, he would, he would have his assistants, you know, work on his paintings, Verrocchio, and that Leonardo painted one of the angels, the one um, on the left. Well, I think, yes. I mean, it's, it's um, uh, and for better or for worse, the apocryphal stories are, may well be true, and they're, they're, they're among the few things we have to go on. This is a, a part of something that is mentioned by Giorgio Vasari, who is the, really the first art historian. He's writing around 1550. So this is basically 100 years after Leonardo's birth um, and uh, 30 years after his death, relying on other notes and tales that are related from others. So it, it's, it's, there are aspects of it that we, we can verify in his biography that we know it to be accurate. There are others that seem to be doubtful. And there are others that are just very good stories that may well reflect the personality of the artist. So um, these, these are what we, we don't put too much authority, but we don't dismiss anything when, when reviewing these. And, and one of them has to do with the baptism that we just saw, and the detail that's on the left of the two angels. The, 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 the angel that's on the right of that image is a little more stage traditional part of the kind of the controlled 15th century maybe direct obs idea of observation. And then this figure on the left um, turning is a kind of angelic quality. Uh, it seems to be a really uh, a, a figure from a different world and, and, and has the beginnings of what one sees in the, as a portrayal of personality, which is, I think, one of the hallmarks of Leonardo's great advance as a painter. Um, even you see it a little bit in the, the, the other two images, the, the detail that Colleoni monument of this um, uh, bellicose, he's a, a, the, the monument celebrates a, a, a general in a kind of fanciful helmet. And in the drawing next to it, which is by Leonardo, which is kind of a, a, a for more of a, a, a fanciful takeoff of the whole thing, you get a sense more of, of, a, of a figure who really has a personality in there, even as the armor is even more divorced from reality. So, I mean, the recognition that there was something, let's say, special, advanced, um, creative, that the ability to make the angel look more ethereal was, was, was something that, um, uh, you know, perhaps propelled him forward in terms of his stature, let's say. He was still an apprentice, but in, in terms of his ability to move forward in the art world. Well, fairly soon he was... Uh, um, uh entered the, the guild, became an independent um, uh, artist, was able to undertake his own commissions, and um, while still working with Verrocchio on certain projects. So I think in the next image we have, well, these are, these are actually the uh, pictures that were done in Florence in the 1470s, where is there some of the very celebrated ones, the portrait on the left of Ginevra da Benci, which is in the National Gallery of Art in, in Washington, the only Leonardo in, in, in the Western Hemisphere. And, uh, and the picture on the right, which is a, a very small uh, depiction of the Virgin and Child. It's in the Hermitage uh, in Leningrad. So he's, he is receiving some independent commissions. Uh, at the same time, he's still working with Verrocchio. And uh, clearly, from the evidence of these and from other commissions at the time, he's receiving uh, some notice as a, as a quite a uh, distinguished artist. Um, and while he's receiving notice, and I think being noticed, it seemed, was important, um, maybe not as important as it was to some other artists. I mean, Verrocchio seems, was not, not only had a talent, but was a businessman and, um, you know, wanted to, I mean, part of being noticed was to get commissions and to make a good living, um, something that curiously didn't always seem to be at the top of Leonardo's list. Well, we see we see it a, a, a little bit in terms of the, the businessman quality. Let's say is that very early on he's receiving some important commissions, Leonardo, that is, but not able to fulfill them. He has a, a, a commission to paint a altarpiece in the Palazzo Vecchio, which was the the, the city hall of uh, of Florence. Uh, very important commission for whatever reasons he doesn't work on it at all, 
He later, I'll show you in a minute, uh, another large altarpiece of the Adoration of the Magi for a church in Florence, which he does work on and paints, but is abandoned. Um, as is, uh, as we'll see, a, a kind of um, a habitual um, uh, situation with Leonardo, that projects are begun, um, they're <coughs> abandoned. We don't, sometimes we can, under, we can determine the, the practical reasons why that happens, has happened. Others, it has to do with uh, clearly an attempt to perfect, to keep working on it, um, uh, and that may be the case with, with Mona Lisa, which is a, uh, a portrait begun in, in, in Florence in the early 1500s that he kept with him his entire life, and even after he's uh, in France, he still has the painting 20 years later. So um, the, the, uh, the whole, whole question of the unfinished with Leonardo is one that certainly we, we struggle to understand psychologically. All right, so when you think of someone who cannot finish things, you know, you think of multiple possibilities, and obviously we don't have evidence to know which one it is here, but, um, but there can be the intense, the, the motivation that is purely curiosity and figuring out the task. And once the task is understood, um, it no longer holds, you know, great interest for that person. And, um, and, and certainly, um, you know, painting was only a small part of what Leonardo was interested in and did. He was a mathematician, he was an architect, he was, um, he was a thinker, a philosopher, uh, you know, he was interested in, in military, in, in pacifism, in so many different arenas that he had ex expertise in, really. So um, one wonders if, you know, it was, um, once the challenge of figuring out the painting was done, you know, it just wasn't that compelling anymore. But you also have to think about uh, people who are, um, let's say, so obsessional and perfectionistic, as you're saying, that things have to be done in a very certain way. And, um, and, and you know, Freud might chime in on that finishing something is like a loss, right? Mm -hmm. You're done and then you have to move on and that never finishing is a way of um, permanently sort of keeping it alive for yourself. Mm -hmm. And for someone who had the loss of his mother at five, then the loss of the stepmother who died um, and sort of, and then, you know, um, left the family to, to uh, be an apprentice and so on and had many losses, one would just wonder, you often see that, somebody with a lot of early losses who um, needs to hold on to things. Of course. Just and the, I'm speculating, I say, <laughs> just to be As clear. an aspect of the speculation about the loss of his mother, we don't really know that because later on when he's in Milan, on a particular document which he's listing dependents, there's yes. a woman named Katerina. Right. And then Katerina disappears. She dies probably at that point. Right. Oh, so we don't know whether, in fact, he was staying close to her. Right. Through, um, and, and so the whole, you know, he may have been supporting her. We just have no idea of, of, of really those, those kind of crucial aspects that we look for in terms of wanting to get a little better sense right, so of his Right, so we don't personnel. know if he stayed in touch with her, but what, but, and that could have been, yeah. but still we know that he was removed from her home. So in other words, he was moved to a different home, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, in today's terms, right? You, your parents divorce, you yeah. go to another, you know, you go back and forth, it's difficult, it's yeah. difficult. But it wasn't so unusual for the time. Um, except that, you know, it was um, to be in a family where everybody is legitimized except you um, could be difficult. I don't even know whether there was a, a, a functionality to become legitimate in, in that situation. It's right. Really, um, right, But right. so it may not even, even have been, a, you know, an issue that way. But just to going back to the curiosity, I think this is a good point just to introduce Leonardo's drawings again. And this one is of a Tuscan landscape and this is unusual because we know the date of it specifically. It's 1473. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, he's inscribed it. The, you know, this is the uh, the day of the uh, the festival of Mary of the Snows, which is August 5th, 1473. And it it actually is both Leonardo's earliest landscape drawing, um, and it's also the earliest dated landscape drawing by anyone that we that we know. So. Landscape is very much a modern concept in terms of painting. We don't see it in the, in the certainly not in the medieval times, not in the Renaissance uh, at all. Pure landscape painting really comes into its own in the 17th century. But here we're seeing Leonardo clearly exploring, recording nature, 
And below that is just a quotation from one of his writings in which he, um, he's alluding to the power of the artist really to uh, what, what, the, what an artist can do in sort of creating this uh, uh, fantastic imagery. Um, but for him at this point, it's probably uh, most of all uh, observation, uh, curiosity, and really in terms of what makes him go on to an, another field, it, I think one has to, uh, I would vote most of all for that uh, uh, curiosity and interest in all things that he, uh, to understand them and, and to, uh, to, to, uh, to develop whatever kind of knowledge one can uh, you know, about them. And when you talk about people of genius who have, you know, uh, who, who by definition have this high creativity, curiosity is, is probably one Certainly. of, you know, yeah. the most important traits, I would say. So th this, um, since we're talking about his left-handedness and uh, uh, we just give you a, a very clear indication of it. Um, on the left-hand side is a, a, a photograph of uh, a manuscript by uh, Leonardo, and, and it's written in celebrated backward mirror writing. Uh, and it, it can be, this uh, I just did by taking the image and flipping it over, and you can see on the top, the top uh, uh, line, it's sort of the title, Figura Humana. Um, and that's what he's, the human figure. So just, and below, if you can even make out the letters, it is really quite legible, quite rash, uh, rational, not in any kind of secret code as sometimes thought, thought to be, but probably done because of the phenomenal practicality of, of uh, the need to write a lot, to draw a lot, and uh, writing with wet ink and not having the issue that a left-handed person would have of sort of going over what he's written by writing left to, left to right. So, um, and you could say, so it, it could be a purely practical, but certainly an ability and a talent that plenty of left-handed people do not have. It's interesting, actually, that um, uh, there have been, there's been, there's, there actually has been a study to look at people who are capable of mirror writing, and it seems to correlate with people who have a larger corpus callosum. That's the part of the brain that connects both hemispheres, um, and um, it, um, let's say, the ability to bring creative thought to fruition has a lot to do with hyperconnectivity of the brain. So uh, one's ability to have what might be a thought in a hemisphere that has more to do with artistic ability or technical ability and have it move to an area that can actually do that in a motor sense. Um, so it's just, it's interesting because it, it, even if you're a lefty and this is a practical solution, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously people have speculated, did he do this so that people couldn't read his writing and therefore know his um, thoughts and, and perhaps steal his inventions mm -hmm. and so on? We don't have any evidence for that. It could have, as you said, been this practical. But either way you want to look at it, it certainly was an ability that may also speak to his genius and his creative oh, Absolutely, I think, I think it has a, uh, uh, I mean, determining first that that would be an aid in whether it's in, in recording the spontaneity of his thoughts or recording uh, both in terms of drawing and uh, the related imagery. And of course, one of the, uh, even if you look at the Leonardo manuscripts, um, I don't think there's anything quite like it until that time in terms of the, Im the combination of images and text. It's sort of, it's something that never really was, was brought together before, but with Leonardo, clearly it was a major part in how he, in his thought process and in how he recorded things, and, and then determining that, that this would be something to do and then being able to do it, it seems effortlessly, um, is certainly a, a, a mark of his, uh, uh, of his genius. Yes. Um, actually, it wasn't long after this time, sort of in his, um his early 20s, early to mid 20s, that um, the question of his sexuality um, came up because he was charged with sodomy, and uh, twice actually, um, and um, those charges didn't stick. He was um, he was held, and then the charges were cleared. He was accused with several other yes. young men. Again, it's very difficult to say what does this mean because um, anybody could accuse you. Anybody could name anything without any evidence. Um, sometimes it was done to keep a competitor down, to say, I, I recognize you as being my competition and I'm gonna accuse mm -hmm. you of something and besmirch your name um, on the one hand. And of course, on the other hand, we know that 
Leonardo never married. We don't know of any relationships with women. We also don't know of any relationships with men. Um, and, but we do know that many of his drawings were, uh, were, he tended to draw men more than he drew women um, and drew some very, um, a, a lot of the men had a, a very beautiful, let's say, beautiful quality to them, very sensual quality to them. You know, I think there's a, there, throughout, throughout all his, uh, his, his drawings uh, and, and imagery, there is a sensual quality that, uh, and, and even in some of the images we'll show in a minute, an androgynous quality and that the, 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 uh, uh, there's a feminine quality to the, many of the male subjects and there's a male quality to some of the um, female subjects. Um, and uh, so, uh, and of course there's much speculation about his personal life. Of course, sadly we don't really, or maybe not sadly, we don't really know uh, very much about it. The, the accusation of sodomy is done with an, an anonymous note in a, in, a, in a sort of an accusation box which they ha would, would keep in Florence and nobody ever showed up to prefer the charges as it were so is uh, uh, on the other uh, uh, you know, and, and interestingly enough the issue of homosexuality in Florence at the time ha had a you know it was a extremely you know it was not a big deal it was tolerated in a way ab absolutely it was rather, rather fluid um, uh, uh, and yet the official charge of it was, uh, could, it could be prosecuted even up, up until death. That was on the, on the so was, to, make, to make that charge is really quite serious, although the practical issue uh, of, I mean, and I think I was reading something that in, that basically there were, um, the, I mean, there was an, a record of the number of, of accusations of this kind, and there really were quite a lot, whether, what actually was done in terms of prosecution. Um, you know, I think it was it was basically uh, tolerated. It may not be all that dissimilar to the situation. A lot of parts of the country where there are laws on the books that have been for a long there a long time and that really aren't aren't, aren't pursued. But um, he was a very handsome man. I mean, he there are some self uh, there are there are portraits of Leonardo. He is reported to be well. I just he's more than that. I mean, he's he's always he's described in the in including Vasari as being particularly handsome, of being particular beautiful countenance. And of and also of his personality being especially um, uh, not only benign but generous in, in a way, but um, uh, the image they showed at the beginning, which is a profile portrait of a very advanced age, uh, probably by one of his students, is one of the few that one can mm. give with some authority. Even the most famous image of Leonardo, the one of the great bearded man in Turin, which I think we all recognize that if it isn't by Leonardo. It's what he should look like. It's this kind of absolute genius figure, very serious. And, and many art historians, maybe even most art historians, don't believe that represents Leonardo. There's no question mm -hmm. that he drew it. But the idea that uh, it doesn't, in terms of the style, it doesn't quite fit with the age that he would have been at the time the drawing was done. So there are, um, I mean, in the image that's on the, on the screen, this uh, uh, unfinished altarpiece in Florence, the figure at the, at the lower right, sort of turning away, that's been thought to be a self-portrait of Leonardo. But again, it's, it's, uh, it's just speculation. But just, just to leave our field for a second, since we're going with the slides, this picture is being cleaned now, and the, the two images on the right, top and bottom, show these, these two figures that are just emerging from a lot of discolored varnish and a lot of overpaint. So I think within the next year or so, when the picture is back on, uh, on view, you'll see a much more vibrant painting, um, with uh, even though it's unfinished, with with uh, uh, his drawing and painting in this kind of uh, brown uh, Brunei color, uh, mm -hmm. much more vibrant. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so he um, did need to essentially have a job, <laughs> let's say, um, and and um, and in presenting himself uh, to. Um, the new ruler. Um, he he had a, his. This was his resume, and uh, and he's he's, he's sent to, to from Florence from Lo by Lorenzo the Magnificent to to the court of Milan, um, as uh, with, with a. Um, uh, if we could just go forward one slide, I'll just mm -hmm. and we'll come. Oh, maybe let's go back. Then. We'll, we'll we'll go there. We'll talk about this first. Um, his his um, as a as a. Im improviser on the lyre as a musician. We don't think of him very much as a, in that capacity, but evidently he, he was celebrated as well for his singing abilities. 
Um, and, um, but whether when, it, it is when he's now in Milan or just before, he compiles this extraordinary letter, which I, we've head, headed as the most phenomenal resume. And notably, it's written left to right. So it's, it's, it's a draft. It's something that would have been revised, copied over, and, and, then, and then submitted. That's why it basically survived with Leonardo's papers, uh, in which this array of, of abilities is, is listed. And um, so, you know, we tend to think of, most people think of Leonardo as the artist. And really, it, art wasn't necessarily the to, the, where he spent the predominant amount of his time. He I would say what the top number of paintings that we could possibly say was 30? Uh, probably fewer, like, than, fewer, 20. Than, fewer, fewer than, 20. than 20. I mean, so, uh, you know, the number is kind of 17 so, or 18, but for uh, over the course lifetime, of an artist's career, it's that's a, nothing. That's a small number. Yeah. And, and many of them are sort of repetitions, even. Um, so he did spend a lot of his time thinking about and wanting to implement um, architectural design, um, military application, um, which is so interesting and kind of curious because in many ways he's described as a pacifist, you know, very um, anti-violence. And um, of course it was somewhat a, a necessity of the times. So they're, they're, you know, they kept being attacked and there was war and, um, and your value to the leader of the time would, would be enhanced, of course, if you could come up with military application. But sometimes, I don't know if this is, again, apocryphal or not, but he would come up with something and not necessarily bring it to fruition out of the thought that it would be in the wrong hands, let's say, not good for humanity to um, necessarily have. Does that sound really? apocryphal? It, yes. it, sounds, it sounds more like Oppenheimer and the H-bomb. Okay, right, exactly. <laughs> but, but, That's but, exactly uh, but, but, but I mean, I think, I think that um, certainly a lot of these machines and war machines, and we'll look at them in, in a second, uh, were never built. Uh, they could have been built. They could have been, uh, and, and the ideas of, you know, behind them uh, were, then, were taken up in centuries following. So it's kind of, uh, of, of many of them. So, um, the, so the idea that they were just completely ahead of their time, yes. mathematically correct, let's say. Um, so his, his ability, again, without education, to employ physics and mathematics um, and architectural design was really is, was yeah. astonishingly ahead of If we can call it in, in, instinctive, it's, one, it's a, even a very sort of simple way of doing it because it's really quite phenomenal, his understanding of, of mechanics and, and uh, creating a a practical uh, application for them. But just, we'll I'll give, show a, a few images in a second, but just oh. if we go back, just leave that. The, the interesting thing is I've summarized the, these listings and the numbers that, that are there, not in order, because it is sort of a draft, uh, but they correspond to the images, the, the numbers on the, on, the, on the screen there. But the last two I le left in the full quotation because these are the things that we think of as being the most important and the most, uh, rewarding aspects of Leonardo's career are the afterthought. After all these bridges and after uh, the fortresses and battlements and war machines, he, yes, he can also paint pictures and he can also make a sculpture. And uh, so there's almost a, 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 a comical aspect of that as we, as we look at it now because these things which we are, are, are pr probably the, the aspects of his career that we respond to the most are almost afterthoughts in his in his uh, job application, if you will, to the to the Duke of uh, of Milan, and the Duke um, is this the Duke that wanted him to uh, create the horse, the the great yes, yes indeed the sculpture horse, of the horse, the horse which would be a monument to his, the Duke's father, mm -hmm. um, and which occupied uh, Leonardo's uh, much of Leonardo's time. There are studies of the anatomy of the horse, there are studies of the sculpture of the practical issues of casting the horse. The horse was evidently realized in a clay form, but never really uh, cast in, in, in bronze, um, in, certainly not in Leonardo's uh, And it's time. interesting because Verrocchio did a horse, um, which did last and was in bronze, and, um, and, um, but, but somehow, again, Leonardo had difficulty completing this. This was like an ongoing, ongoing I think there may have been, it, may, it was, but it was also the practical issues of the, of the cost and the materials from, that would have to come from the Duke. Mm -hmm. And so the bronze that was dedic would have been dedicated to that was 
went to canons or something of, of a more practical nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But just on the next image, these, these, these are a few of the, of the um, uh, designs for military uh, devices. In, in, the, in the lower left, you see these kind of these cannon fusil, these displays of, 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 of mass annihilation, not annihilation, but of, of sending cannonballs over troops uh, at, at once. The one above it of, a, of basically a tank uh, and of a, a kind of a, above that a, a it's like a, a scythe that's mechanical that could uh, destroy any any infantry that in this path. The 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 crossbow that you see in the upper right is of a, a huge scale. Uh, this would be a giant crossbow, not something that could ever be carried. You can see the scale of the people on, uh, below it, and then um, below that a. a something that's very similar to a Gatling gun in the center and, and, and fortress battlements. So these are very serious applications of military prowess and of, both, and of creativity because some of these were just never ever conceived. I also think what's it's really fascinating is how he held in his mind the, the designs and the interest for creating this, which you know obviously is about violence, and at the same time, was, you know... Um, was a vegetarian. Was a vegetarian, <laughs> was a vegetarian at a time when game hunting was yeah. like the deal. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was all about what animals could you, you know, shoot, bring home and serve to your guests. And, um, you know, so he was a vegetarian, he was a pacifist, he had this elegance, he had, the, you know, he was invested yeah. in the arts and the music and it seems so uh, counter... Oh, and, of course, and as we'll come to, his investigation of anatomy and refinement of his ability through the dissection of corpses, um, which he uh, not, you know, did and then drew in this very um, unemotional sort of way, and, um, and even sometimes spending time with the curious fascination of what, what is happening at the end of life there. What is you know, sitting with someone and then wanting to open them up right away, and um, what is he going to see, and, it, it, and, and sort of this um, much more objective, curious, non-emotional light, and on the other hand, this very sensitive, humane man. Yeah, there's a dispassionate quality to many of the drawings that are, that, uh, are so literal in, 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 ter in terms of the, uh, the human figure particularly. Um, just Oops. here, well, 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 we'll look at this right now. This is, this is uh, just getting into... Another aspect, which really has to do is investigations of flight, um, and you're seeing. You had a great fascination with flight, yeah. and, and this was... had also had to do with the study, very obviously allied with with the flight of birds. So, uh, uh, and even going back to the to one of the stories that was told about Leonardo by Vasari is that he would go to the market and he would buy caged birds, which were there, and he would buy them and set them free, and so. Uh, uh, this can show a lot of different aspects of his personality. One is just the, the, the kind of the humanitarian quality about it. Also, there was a kind of uh, classical tradition that it is a very good omen to do to set a, a prisoner free, even if a, even a, a bird. It's also studying the bird's flight, and uh, and we see that uh, in in um, in his drawings. Um, and this kind of a hybrid one on the, on the left in which the articulated uh, framework of uh, whether the, the bones of a, of a bird's wing is, is morphing into the actual device that would be needed to propel a, uh, a figure in, into flight. The figure on the uh, drawing in the upper right is a kind of proto-helicopter, the one in the center, a, a parachute essentially, and, and uh, also on the left is a, a different kind of flying machine. So these are th things that were never brought uh, to creation, and really what he needed there was just the power to make them work. Um, if he had an engine, they would fly, but he didn't. So really, really, really ahead of his time. And then getting back to uh, the musical issue uh, on his trip up to Milan, uh, this is drawing in the upper right-hand corner there of a fanciful lyre. Uh, uh, the, the, the instrument, that he would improvise on was called the lira da braccio, which is a, a handheld violin-like uh, a, a lyre, which you see uh, held by an angel in a painting by a, a student of Leonardo's. And in, in, in the drawings, uh, you'll see this kind of uh, bizarre, uh, evidently functioning version of, of it that's with these sort of grotesque attachments. And, 
and then uh, what today someone has done in, in recreating what that looked like. And, and, and on the left, we're ha showing the, the Leonardo's portrait of a musician, which is thought to be uh, Atalante Migliorotti, who was uh, a, a celebrated singer with whom Leonardo went to Milan at the, uh, with, uh, at the invitation of um, uh, the request, rather, of Lorenzo de' Medici. The painting of the hands is something that was um, somewhat unusual for the time, that he was, let's say, forward-thinking in terms of using hands in his portrait to be expressive, to express something of the personality of, of the person who's yeah, painting. Yeah, one sees them uh, in, in portraiture before, but they just tend to be little appurtenances resting on a ledge, whatever, without any really expressive quality. And uh, as you'll see, uh, if we go forward to the, the image of the... Um, Lady with an ermine. Um, uh, well, should we go forward? To yeah, let's go. Let's we'll go. Come back. We'll, we'll come go back. back to these drawings. Uh, you know, that's an extraordinary hand, and it, it almost tells as much about the personality of of this woman, who's probably the was the the mistress of the Duke of, of Milan, as as the quality in her face. This is a, a portraiture of a of a different kind because when we look at this painting, whether in person or reproduction, you have the sense of a, of a of a an internal psychological being, uh, as opposed to just really someone who's recording the outward features, which is basically what portraiture had been. So these are two portraits, both done by Leonardo in in uh, in his. Um, now he he in um, did it also say something about what he felt about the person? I mean, I he liked this woman, right? This it's hard to think that he didn't. I mean, there's, there's uh, I think for anyone who who has uh, ever try to paint a portrait, uh, there is always a bond uh, of some, it can be antagonistic, it's true, but, um, but there, there's some, something that one feels that there was a, a connection that if, if, she, if this woman was not as extraordinary as she appears to be, he saw qualities in her that, uh, that he could bring out, and those are the ones that he decided to focus on and to preserve. So there is the, this, uh, uh, and I think this this kind of idealization is something that you'll see throughout his career, whether it's uh, a portrait of a woman or a man or of a composition or of a or of a concept. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go back. Um, I I think also uh, it was somewhere around this time that he brought on um, a boy to live with him, Salai Salai, um, a ten year old who apparently was. Um, often misbehaved, stealing little bits of mm -hmm. money and so on. And, um, and then later there's another, uh, a, a young man, I mean he brought on apprentices who, that he would teach and, mm -hmm. and so on who felt very, he developed these real attachments. Um, yeah, no question about it, uh, about that. And from what, even, again, we, we, we reach for some of the uh, little, little notes in the manuscript, when one in which Leonardo um, refers to Salai, which is kind of a slang word for scoundrel or whatever. Um, as you know, having stole, stolen uh, things from the studio and up to, you know, uh, up to no good. He was, was trained as a painter. There are paintings that are attributed to him, and he stayed with Leonardo his entire life. Uh, we know that after um, after Leonardo's death in France, he returns to Milan. We have, interestingly enough, record of his marriage and of a dispute with uh, in this estate, and he. Sadly, came to bad end, having been shot in a uh, by a, by a soldier. Um, but uh, these are drawings that are sometimes thought to be um, representative of Salai or just of uh, ideal types. But you see, even in in uh, in drawing this kind of very handsome, very sensual uh, young man, he's thinking of other things. And uh, the drawing of the of the young man there. Is on a page in which there's st studies of the of the heart. You can see them. It's a combination of an anatomy study and 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 a uh, um, an image of a of a person. The, uh, the drawing on the left, in which the head is contrasted with the head of an old man. Wh whether this is a meditation on on old age or meditation on changes of beauty. Um, I mean, as much as the indi individual images are absolutely fascinating. The, the contrast that Leonardo uh, creates on the page um, and with the text are often extremely revealing. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and yet, even though he clearly found the, the beauty in men was very important and sensual, he was also very uh, aware and often drew women in this very beautiful light. After, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and in an intriguing way, this uh, standing figure on the left, which seems to be inviting one into, one doesn't know, into another world, it seems, uh, the, this central figure, which is perhaps a study for a, a, a depiction of the, of the Madonna, but she's obviously very much a real woman. Um, and, and the one on the right, so inviting and, again, related to a, a drawing of an angel, but also clearly a, uh, 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 someone whose face, whose visage, whose personality, something he responded to. We don't know a lot about his religious thinking. He was not um, extremely involved with the church. Again, he was not, he was not you know, educated uh, by the church. He maybe, I don't know, half of his paintings are sort of of religious material, but um, yeah, easily I mean, half are not. I mean, uh, some have uh, speculated that he was essentially a heretic, some that he was an atheist. Um, we know that he was baptized. We just saw the record of it. Uh, but the subjects that he uh, painted, some of them are, uh, half of them as, are, 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 are religious in nature. Um, though it's very interesting to see that the quality of them is, is really quite universal, and it doesn't really depend on Christianity. Mm -hmm. it's, um, uh, uh, he seems to be interested in, in, in the, the stories that are told by the paintings as a vehicle toward express, expressing human emotions and in human conflicts. And, uh, and so I, uh, even in the, the picture that I was involved in, which is a, a half-length portrayal of Christ, um, I, other people do find it a very religious, moving picture in, in terms of their belief. But uh, I find it a, a spiritual painting and, uh, that doesn't really depend on any particular religion. And he was, but it was interesting that as, Interested as he was in beauty, it, he was not interested in painting the world necessarily in a beautiful light. That many of his drawings and, and interests and paintings had to do with ugliness and uh, uh, yeah. even grotesqueness. Clearly fascinated by by the ugliness of the world, by the ugliness of people, and sort of uh, whether he's taking a a. a, a an actual figure, and then elaborating on the, the, the grotesque features, or in some of these sort of creating these fan, fantastically ugly figures, or combining them in a way, uh, the, 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 this, this uh, drawing in the upper right, which seems to show a, a classically attired uh, gentleman with, with uh, uh, laurel in his, um, in his hair, being, being pickpocketed, being mocked by gypsies, evidently. These are the, these are, this is a, another aspect of, his, uh, of, of what he sees in, in humanity, which is, um, uh, seems to be the full range of, of, uh, of our uh, uh, qualities. And he managed to, um, right, at times have this sort of, I mean, it was always in this vein of curiosity, this objectivity, uh, whether, you know, th what came from a corpse, what came from something he saw or experienced. Um, he was present at a at a hanging and, and stood and drew um, what he saw, uh, where other people would be, you know, maybe horrified and emotionally affected. Um, it's hard to know what he was thinking, but he seemed to be able to take on this objective, curious stance and learn from yeah, whatever, no matter how upsetting. And, and the, 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 the interest is, uh, it seems to go everywhere, both in terms of nature, in terms of people, in terms of the horrors of, 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 of what men do, and in terms of the beautiful things that, that, that humanity can, can do. And even in terms of the inspiration for his art, there's one passage in, the, uh, in this treatise on, on painting in which he suggests to the artist that he, he look at, at a wall and the decaying plaster and the patterns of, of, of it and to take inspiration from that. I mean, this is something that is you know, an abstract painter today w might, might find some, uh, some uh, sympathy with. But to the idea that someone who's so ground on, uh, grounded on observation, on botany studies for every, every uh, uh, flower that appears in a, in a painting, could also uh, find inspiration in the randomness of, uh, of uh, the, what he sees visually. It shows another aspect of, of this personality. So we saw, we saw her. So, so if it goes to 
go to the most, fa most famous religious picture, which is the Last Supper. Um, and and uh, uh, I think it's, it's worth just think, we, it's a kind of picture like the Mona Lisa, we kind of accept and don't really think about what's going on. It's such an icon, it's such an image. And so many, with so many variations uh, on it. But, but before this time, I mean, this was a, a scene mostly depicted to demonstrate the Eucharist. It was uh, something that would be, uh, as this picture was, decoration for the, for the dining hall of a, of a monastery. But for Leonardo, he's, give, he's, he's brought this, made it a, a hugely dramatic event. It's the moment when Christ is saying, one of you will betray me. And there now is this tremendous reaction, like a, a, a tidal wave that goes out from him. And they're all you know, reacting with disbelief or, and denial. Um, uh, of it. So this, in a way, uh, I don't see it as being particularly religious. I see this as a kind of a, uh, a, a prototypical, cinematic, dramatic uh, uh, portrayal of something which, of course, is interested in a whole succession of, of human emotions and in the depiction of them just as if each one were, were a, a, an individual portrait. You know, as you're saying that, I am thinking that it was um, by this time, his father and his uncle had died. And the siblings had, um, had come together to uh, basically deny that any sh monies should be left to Leonardo, mm -hmm. um, that they had sort of banded together, if you will, in this betrayal. And, um, and he tried to fight that. Mm -hmm. he, he, he um, tried to, I, I don't think that he was successful, but um, he really did try to fight that. And uh, I have thought about this painting in, in light of that in his own personal. The, the reading of the will. The reading of the will <laughs> and, the, and his own personal betrayal. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure he's, you know, he's taking in, he's, he's absorbing everything from what, what he's seeing from those very close to him and those distant and, uh, it's, it sort of goes into this phenomenal funnel of genius and what comes out, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. great painting. So. Mm -hmm. But his own experience of, uh, of pain and uh, an emotional upheaval, and it's, it's interesting how few things we do hear about his emotion. For a man of such, let's say, intellectual passion, I think it's really curious that we don't hear about passionate relationships in his life. So it, it must go somewhere. Um, yeah, and I think, one, of course, one aspect of that is that um, uh, he didn't write about himself. He was they're, 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 with this phenomenal intellect uh, came a humility that's pretty uh, hard to fathom because, uh, he, you know, clearly he had a, a great idea of his of his worth and his talent and his genius, and uh, and he wanted that. I mean, he wanted to be the the Leonardo. I mean, you know, I mean, in other words, <laughs> well, let's say, um, at one point I thought he wanted to be uh, Leonardo uh, da, you know, Milan, or, you know, in other words, da, da Vinci was, Vinci was uh, small, uh, and um, <laughs> maybe to be, you know. He, I don't know what his ambition is. We, we don't know what his ambition is. Might, might have been, but certainly, um, you know, this is not someone with uh, low self-worth. Low yeah. self-worth, right. <laughs> Confident, but not. Yeah. But as you said, humble, like not needing to uh, be a braggart or. or uh, and I think or it's arrogant. also we were, we were speaking a little bit about it when we came in about about we don't see him in his career competing for major uh, commissions, competing for patronage. Um, uh, not long after uh, the, uh, the Last Supper, he's in Rome. Michelangelo is there. Um, Raphael's there. The, Pope is creating great commissions for the, the Vatican. And uh, certainly there's a lot of politics going on in terms of what, who's getting what, but he's not involved in it. And when he leaves um, Italy to go to France under the patronage of, of uh, Francis I, it may be as well just to get away from all that. As, um, it may be kind of the, the ultimate fellowship scholarship uh, that, that he receives when he, when he goes to France where he's pretty much given what he, what he, what he wants, what he to wants do. to do. we know anything about rivalries with, um, with Michelangelo, with, with younger artists coming up and, and being very competitive? Well, we, you know, it's, it's certainly said uh, that there was a, a rivalry with Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo, from what we know, we know a little more about his personality, was a, a, a far more competitive uh, uh, figure. 
uh, and yet there's clearly respect, uh, you know, between between them. So there's no, uh, in Florence in the early 1500s, uh, there is a uh, commission for two walls in the in the Palazzo Vecchio. One Leonardo's painting a Battle of Anghiari, and uh, Michelangelo is painting the Battle of Cascine, another another huge mural. Neither of which survive, and um, so there was kind of a physical um, uh, uh, competition in terms of having these two great projects next to each other. Um, but what we, we, again, we know uh, about any kind of personal conflict is, is extremely uh, unreliable and even has to do with certain anecdotes. Uh, you know, there, there, there's, uh, there are a couple that are told about the two of them meeting and they're kind of um, uh, they're clearly not getting along, but we just don't, we just don't know. Well, this is a familiar picture. <laughs> but when he was talking about the, I mean, we think of Mona Lisa as this phenomenal image of, of uh, feminine beauty, which she is, and, a ver and phenomenally intriguing because uh, both whether you think of that in a undefinable smile, but all, also I, I, speaking about the androgynous quality, there's a certain masculine quality to this woman. She's not your typical, you know, uh, svelte. Um, uh, she's not even like those those drawings of, that we were looking at before. So there, there's there there is an eternal quality to her. There is a, uh, a universal quality to her that makes it, has made this picture the perhaps the most famous painting ever painted, and uh, and it's only added to by qualities that he's uh, put in in terms of the landscape with these. Um, almost mystical mountains that disappear. Uh, this is a picture that is, as we all know, the subject of endless speculation. And like all really great things, there is there's no answer to it. There's no an there's no solution to Mona Lisa. There's he didn't no even name he didn't name this Mona Lisa. No. Someone else named this Mona Lisa. No, many I mean years it's later. it's um, it's uh, Mona is Mrs. and Lisa was the name of the woman who yes. we we do you believe is so. the subject. Um, one of the even confusing things on, on that first document uh, of the grandfathers watching the baptism, among the people listed as witnesses is someone named Mona Lisa. So, um, uh, but it's uh, clearly not the same woman. But the subject that we do believe uh, to be the subject of the painting was a, a, a young woman, the wife of a, of a merchant in, in, in Florence who was extolled for her uh, for her beauty and for her uh, knowledge. And he really did love, I mean, we, we, we assume that he loved this painting. He kept this painting with him. C took this painting with him from Florence. Ne so this is another commission never delivered to the, um, to the owner. We, when, when somebody visits, Flo um, visits Leonardo in, uh, uh, in France, um, the picture is mentioned. It's, it's one of three paintings that are there. And um, when he died, it's a little unclear exactly how it, how it, whether, how, whether it went directly to the Francis the First, um, probably did. It's not the reason that it's in the Louvre, because it's part of the royal collections. So uh, this is something he kept with him all his life. And we know that there are changes that were done along the way. Um, Which typified uh, something he did do. Right? Yes. He would, he would do like, one day a little thing and, and... Yeah, and there's also, it's not just, you know, I um, want to make your ear go this way as opposed to that, nothing sort of graphic like that, but I think one of the reasons which we haven't really explored too much has to do with uh, Leonardo's interest in optical effects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the in uh, the next picture yes. is, is, is the painting that I was involved in, the Salvatore Mundi. Unlike the Mona Lisa, which is in the Louvre and everyone is pretty much scared to touch because it is so uh, an icon, this is a painting that um, here in New York we were able to uh, analyze through uh, some advanced uh, technical examination and cross sections and the like. And so um, to create one little skin tone in, in his face, we found that there were 17 layers of, 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 of glazes of paint with some things that are completely counterintuitive, uh, an ultra marine blue and you know with uh, another color over it. And so I think part of the fascination that we have one of the reasons for the appeal of Leonardo's paintings has to do with, uh, with this kind of um, extraordinary uh, reality, uh, appearance of reality of, uh, that, that is created. And, and since he's 
Much of his study has to do with optics. Also, there's a practical study of, of, of creating the illusion of reality uh, through a painting. Mm -hmm. And um... again, just to show you, the, the, show you the, even the comparison of lips, and go, just going back to Christ again, um, he's, he's rather feminine for, for Christ. <laughs> so uh, there's mm -hmm. something, even in the fact that he, Leonardo chooses to show him without a, a clear beard, Mm -hmm. It's clean shaven, even his chest, which has a certain, mm. almost a hint of, of breasts, but it's kind of, it's not something that one can really, it's, it's, there, but there is a, uh, uh, in the examination, in the, I'm sorry, the observation of this painting, there is something that appeals across, uh, um, across the sexes, across religions, across cultures um, in, in, uh, uh, in the response that one can have. That it's to androgynous enough to leave up to the yeah. looker. Um, to the, to we the, bring a lot to, of you course. Bring, you're going to bring a lot to the yeah. painting. In, in, in the non-specificity, you will bring yeah. your own. So I kind of think of it as, as, as more of, if I would use it more, I mentioned spirituality, but more universality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and even in the debate, theological debate of whether Jesus was a god or a man, I mean, or both, or how, how it was done. Um, it's, this is a painting that sort of... Speaks to everyone. Yeah, it speaks to everyone and sort of it redefines its own, uh, the own, uh, it, it, mm -hmm. his own concept of it. Mm -hmm. and so the lips, I think, are you know, certainly one thing. And then, you know, with, with, with two paintings that now come after that, the, the, uh, the John the Baptist, which... I think brings this whole androgyny question to a new level because it's a hugely challenging picture, looking straight out at the viewer, engaging, engaging him in this extremely sensual uh, concept of, of uh, a religious figure. And then the uh, painting Madonna and Child at St. Anne in the Louvre, which was recently, recently cleaned, and uh, uh, where many aspects of the, of the tenderness and human relations of the, the Saint Anne being the mother of, of the Virgin Mary, although she's very close in age, it would seem to uh, to to her. And in this uh, amazing balletic uh, configuration of, of 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 figures that create a, a kind of unity, again with this mysterious background. Um, these images I just brought up here just to give you a sense of, of not just the uni universality in terms of his approach to the human form, but in, uh, as his approach in, in science and uh, visual perception. The, the curls uh, on the lower left are the curls from the head of Christ, um, the curls in this drawing of a, of, a, of a woman. And the two other drawings, very similar, have to do with patterns of water flowing. Um, and he's, Leonardo writes about this and how clearly the, he's taking inspiration in and in, in understanding in these natural phenomena in terms of how, uh, how to represent uh, um, these uh, hair and... Uh, and his, uh, his, um, his uh, drawings of anatomy, which you know, he, as we know, he, he dissected. Um, he, he was, as you said, very interested in eyes and, um, and in fact, solving the problem of how to look inside the eye by, um, by putting the eye inside, was it egg? egg hmm. that he put inside and then would boil it so that it would stay firm so that he could make sections. So he sort of creatively how he is going to d do dissections. Um, some incorrect anatomy to start with, some, you know, uh, his attempted drawing what intercourse would look like with places that genitals were not mm -hmm. um, and so on until he, you know, had, had been able to look. Um, but clearly intensely curious about the human body and, and its reverberation yeah. in nature. And these were, just to, to end with, uh, we, 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 we... Actually, you know what? Before we go here, yeah. because I think yeah. we're going to, then we'll start okay. to talk about yeah. his, his end of life. Um, we have two, a couple of audience questions Good. I want to quickly ask. Okay. If he was trained or forced to use his right hand, do you think that would have impacted his artistic abilities? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, obviously, we, we, can't, we can't do that experiment, but... Um, you know, um, I'm sure it's being been studied, right, you know, bring right. predominantly, let's say, right brain. Many more artists are left-handed than um, non-artists. 
So there is, there is clearly something about being a, uh, having a right hemisphere dominance that uh, makes you left-handed that has to do with, and what we don't know is, what does it have to do exactly with the technical ability versus what does it have to do with the creativity or the bringing the creative uh, idea you know, into, into the technical ability? I don't think that is necessarily known. Yeah, I mean, and if he were forced to uh, uh, use his right hand, it would not have affected- Changed his brain dominance, yeah. exactly. And uh, uh, I think more than anything else, what you're anatomically, what we're, I think, it's those connections, those cross connections right and left that are, are really the, uh, uh, the signposts of, uh, of, of, of a special Hallmark mind. Of his, yeah. of his genius. And, and you know, as, you're, as you pointed out, it's not just that he can paint so well, but the, the idea to put the layers of color or, you know, which colors would make it realistic to use perspective to create the cloudiness that creates the ethereal effect. Those are, mm -hmm. those were his ideas that had m more to do with thinking the idea up than than bringing it, you know, than the technical ability mm -hmm. to do it. Um, did any of his ancestors exhibit a gift for art? So do we know where this came from, in other words? No, none, none whatsoever. I mean, we know nothing about Antonio, who wrote that little, uh, he was a notary, and his father, the son, Leonardo's father, was as well. But there's really no indication of any, uh, any special artistic interest. Which is, which is amazing. Um, OK, thank you. How old was he when he died? Okay, so we're about to, we're just about to speak about this. How old was he when he died and where is he buried? Um, and is the Last Supper, in the la oh, in the Last Supper is Mary next to Christ? Okay, so why don't you ask, you okay. answer the Mary Christ question. Okay, and we'll um, Mary's not there. <laughs> so, so it's the, it's just the, it's the apostles and, and, and Christ. Um, and, and uh, again, uh, in various you know, movies and books, there's the idea of the of Mary Magdalene and of, uh, being involved. And but we've seen as throughout his career this kind of feminine quality in the male figures. So John, who's uh, uh, always described as Christ's sort of dearest uh, uh, apostle, is given a, a particularly um, uh, feminine appearance, uh, say more than some of the other figures. We've seen in John the Baptist, different John, uh, a, you know, a kind of uh, challenging uh, feminine quality to it. So I, I don't think that really obtains at all. It's really, these, this is, these are the apostles and, and, and Christ. Um, uh, as for Leonardo's um, life, he was born in 1452. He died in 1519. We see this is, these, these were done toward the end of his life. Um, these are done, these two drawings, and one is of, of a, a kind of a cataclysm destroying a, a little village. The other may be, um, uh, may be almost uh, a, a kind of a joke because it's sort of pots and pans and things raining down from the clouds. It's a deluge of material possessions. But th these are drawings that we know were done when he was in France towards the end of his life and, and may reflect um, some of the philosophical musings that he had as he as he approached the end. Certainly, uh, we we don't know whether he's kind of wishing um, the destruction of of humanity in the in the kind of a uh, a deluge of that sort, or of of or, or perhaps um, uh, response to the iniquitous of of the world, or whether he's he's just having a sort of a fanciful. Uh, uh, exploration of what of, of what would happen if there were really a great storm that uh, could have tremendous force at a level that um, he hadn't particularly seen. Well, certainly, it, there seemed to be evidence. That, you know, the, the the transition from life to death was something that really fascinated him. Um, actually, and and you know, he was um, in some ways, you, you know, you could say a rule breaker, right? I mean, he the rule. It wasn't okay to get dead corpses. No, and no, dissect no. them. <laughs> that was uh, illegal, yep. essentially. Um, so he was taking a risk, um, and clearly he was not overly concerned about that. He did did it quite a bit. Um, so, uh, sort of musings on, I guess, I guess this one, you know, I think about the musings on, um, you know, what matters in life, and then the transition from from life to death, uh, or the power and the power of nature was also uh, at the forefront of his 
concerns, something that yeah, he Yeah, there are certainly great to. themes that one can perceive throughout uh, his work, whether, uh, whether in, in terms of paintings or you see in the drawings, the scientific uh, explorations, and, the, and, and in his writings. I mean, we haven't really talked about that. Uh, they, they were never really compiled uh, by him into any kind of book form, but there's a, something called the Treatise on Painting, which was put together from notes by one of his students. And uh, these are practical aspects, but there are also more philosophical aspects of what art can, can do. Do we, do we know where he was buried? Yeah, he, so he died in, uh, he was given uh, a, uh, a small chateau called Clos Lucet uh, near Amboise in, in France. The, uh, the building still exists, and it's a little Leonardo museum, and he's buried in the chapel nearby. So um, uh, it's visitable. It's a bit of a, a place of pilgrimage for those that are involved with Le uh, Leonardo. And it's a beautiful place uh, to see one can, uh, it was, uh, you know, there, the, part of the legend is that he died in the arms of Francis I. Um, we tend to think that is more legendary, but, um, but certainly he, the last years of his life, he spent uh, painting, writing, designing, he designed uh, uh, some architectural projects for the king, um, but working in, in a kind of uh, uh, very benign, very supportive environment where he was free to do whatever he, uh, he wished. I think um, what's unusual, I mean, obviously, and tends to put him at most tops of the list in terms of genius, mm -hmm. is that he was um, so ex extraordinarily talented in the artistic realm, but so extraordinarily talented in the scientific realm. And it is very unusual since, you know, we, we think, I mean, science is such a sort of logical, rule-bound, um, obviously great discoveries coming out of creative thought, but still um, a, a different type of thought necessarily than, than artistic. And, you know, it's interesting today, we are, we, uh, academic centers are working to, to put together the arts and the sciences more and more, understanding that great innovation will come out of that Venn diagram of the, of the mm -hmm. two areas, um, but that in the 1400s, um, somebody had the mind to be, to excel in both of these arenas so extremely, and to use one in the other, it's really unique. And I think that's why Leonardo today is a, He's not a hero just to people who love art, but he's a hero to technology people. He's a hero to, to, peop, to medical people who look at these uh, anatomical drawings. Yes, some are faulted, some are problematic, some are, but some are phenomenally accurate and, and, and show breakthroughs which really didn't, were, weren't known because they weren't, these weren't published in his time. Uh, the same with mathematical uh, exploration and, and uh, the number of fields um, whether he's speaking about these innovations of flying, which of course never uh, caught on for several hundred years, um, uh, uh, the, the, he he is very much a hero for any kind of serious thinker, uh, any kind, anybody who who, who uh, in in a, in a phenomenal variety of of fields of of inquiry and of uh, profession today, whether it's architecture, art, or as I said, um, even to the the, the 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 most advanced kind of computer. Um, uh, techies. These are the people that help hold him as, as, as their idol. Thank you so much for coming and uh, telling us all about Leonardo. Thank you for coming.